Okay, hi. Good morning. Thanks for joining. Nice to see you all, or at least to see your names. So last week, we ended our discussion, our learning, on a concept which I called competing values. We saw the competing values in a, looking at the episode, the wedding night between Yaakov and his bride, who he thought was Rachel, Rachel, only to discover in the morning that it was Leah. And that led us to a, a discussion about whether the actions taken were appropriate. And I, I want to uh, elaborate a little bit on that concept, especially because we have another instance of these competing values, at least one, but one that I hope to have be able to focus on together with you, we have another case, most likely, of competing values in this week's parsha. So just to, to elaborate on, on what we were saying last week, We have questions. We could have questions. According to the Midrash, and we don't, we don't have all the details in the Torah's account, and, it's, and we're going to see momentarily, Lili Neder, that some of the things that we think that we know so well really come to us from the Midrash and not from the Torah's account. And, and it's interesting what the Midrash adds. But we look at at Rachel, and the uh, Rachel waited seven long years to marry Yaakov, and vice versa. Yaakov waited waited and worked seven long years to marry Rachel. And Lavan, you know, you know, situations were different. You know, today we send out wedding invitations, we put the names of the bride on and everything. Uh, it, you know, it, it wasn't so. There was nobody from Yaakov's side of the family. You know, at the, at the wedding. So, uh, you know, besides we're talking about thousands of years ago and how things might have been handled differently, and, and on top of that, we're talking about Lavan, who is uh, a deceiver. In, call, in Hebrew, we call that a Ramai. He's a, he's a deceiver. So most likely, he sent the word out to some of his friends and neighbors. He says, come on, you know, my daughter's getting married tonight. You know, Maybe it didn't make so much of a difference to the neighbors who the daughter was. You know, there was, uh, you know, Lovin himself was not necessarily under pressure to advertise who was standing under the, the, the chuppah. People came for the, for the celebration, however many that there were. But Yaakov already knew who his future father-in-law was, and Rachel knew also. And Yaakov attempted, he suspected that something could go wrong. And so he attempted to protect himself and Rachel, according to the Medrash, this is not in the Torah text itself, that, that they devised a password that only the two of them knew. Only Yaakov and Rachel knew the password that they were going to whisper under the chuppah that Rachel was going to whisper it under her veil to verify indeed that this was the bride that Yaakov intended to marry and had made arrangements and an agreement with Lavan that this would be his bride. So who, whoever was standing as the bride, as we know, now once the story goes on, we know that it was Leah. So Leah, had the password. And we discussed 
was it like honest? Was it proper for Rachel to share that password? And that's a, a good question. And, and, and what makes it even you know a greater question, although maybe you you feel it's obvious, is that you know we we talk we we talk in in, in halacha we we have the prohibition of lifne ive loti ten show not to put a stumbling block in front of the blind and while certainly we would not want to see anybody doing that in the literal sense but there were also other cases where one can violate that precept one of them could be giving somebody bad information when you know it's bad information and you intentionally provide it to him either for personal gain or for personal unfortunate dissatisfaction and there are and there are sometimes where you could give something to somebody who could not access without you we tend to shy away even when other people could provide but the classic example given in the Gemara is a Nazir a Nazarite who was taking the commitment upon himself to to, uh, to observe uh, restrictions which are not required of of the normal Jew, and in, including not cutting one's hair, not drinking uh, wine products, grape products. So if 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 um, you know it, 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 it here you know it's very easy. It, in Florida to understand the, the example here, if we were walking along the, uh, the, 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 uh, the bank of, of one of the canals, and on the other side of the canal is a fellow that we know, he's the Nazir of Boca. He's taken, there is no such person to my knowledge. It wouldn't be the greatest idea today because you can't get out of the uh, state of Nazarite once you get into it, you know, without the Beit HaMikdash functioning. But let's say there were, uh, there was a, a, a Nazarite in Boca, and we see him on the other side of the canal. Now, most of the canals are not all that wide. You know, and the, and the Nazar yells out and says, you know, you know, I'm, I'm really thirsty. Do you, you have anything to drink? And, you know, and we respond, oh, we're sorry. You know, we just finished. Oh, it says, okay, I'll take the wine. Can can you you know flip it over? It, are you, you know, the cow's not the, the, the ready, but you put the cork in tight and you could flip the bottle over. Maybe he's a good catcher and he'll even catch the bottle, not even have to worry about it hitting the, the land. So that's not allowed. Because he can't get that bottle of wine unless I I'm, I would be guilty on a Torah level of lift naive lo show. Don't put a stumbling block in front of the blind because his passion, his his uh, desire to drink at that point, and maybe it's already come to the point that he really wants to drink w wine. So, so, so that's uh, I'm I'm feeding into that because I'm allowing him to to fail, and if I wouldn't throw him that bottle. Of like, you know, we're walking together, but it's my wine. So none of you can give him my wine either. So I'm the only one that can give him the wine. And that would be prohibited. So that would be, you know, one of the questions against Rachel is, is that, uh, you know, she, she gave something over to Leah to use, which was not meant to be used that way. And it, and it was used in a dishonest way. So, and so there's a, a certain aspect of dishonesty involved with, with, with Rachel and enabling Leah to play a role of dishonesty. But we said last week that we, we can have sometimes competing values. And sometimes that plays out in having to choose between two. Sometimes it's, it's between, it could be between choosing two things that appear to be right and one could be harmful to somebody embarrassing or introduce a you know negative mitzvah but 
But last, I want to continue right now in terms of where we, we were looking at last week, that the competing values here is which is the better of the bad choices. It's a bad choice to have to uh, be and enable somebody else to be dishonest. Allowing your sister to uh, to be embarrassed after the chuppah when her identity would be revealed and she would be very embarrassed. So Rachel chose to avoid embarrassing her sister. Embarrassment in, uh, in, in, in halacha is considered to be a very, very serious thing. And, and Rachel deemed it to be the She compromised on the integrity part to save her sister from embarrassment. It seems really that, that God agreed with her as well. There is a, a, a medrash, it's a moving medrash, that as B'nai Yisrael, the nation of Israel, was being marched off into Golis, diaspora, exile, as slaves. And after the you know, destruction in our, in our midst and losing our autonomy, that the soul of Abraham came before God to pray on behalf of his children. And God didn't accept his prayers. And then Yitzchak came. Boy, and Yitzchak, you know, if his father was able to say, I, I, I went to such lengths to observe you know, your commandments, Hashem. And Yitzchak could say, I, I went to such lengths that I allowed myself to be on the altar. And I saw that knife coming down to me and I didn't flinch. And God didn't accept Yitzchak's argument either, nor that of... Uh, of, Rachel, of, uh, of Yaakov. And, the, and the, uh, the, the list, one after the other, people were rejected in their pleas until Rachel, Rachel, made her plea. Now, she didn't get what she wanted, but she's the only one that got a positive response. Shavu vanim ligvulam. Don't worry, Rachel. Your nation will return to its borders, to its land. And Rachel merited the response from Hashem, while the other great people did not, because of this oral history of her foregoing her turn to be under the chuppah with Yaakov. Originally, it appears that Yaakov's intention was only to marry one wife, and that would have been Rachel. And when Rachel passed that code to Yaakov, she had to assume that she also passed up her opportunity to marry Yaakov. It turns out that, you know, Lovin had, a, I guess, a good idea when Yaakov objected by saying there could be a second marriage and you could have a second wife. But it wasn't the original plan. And, and, and Rachel really, she gave up things so personally important to her on behalf of her sister's well-being. And that is what Hashem recognized. And at least he wasn't prepared, Hashem was not prepared to change the exile, but he shared the promise with Rachel that the exile will come to an end and the Jewish people will return to their land as we've seen happening in our lifetime. This morning's Jerusalem Post uh, uh, included an article on the population growth in Israel. You know, not, uh, not every country, especially the, the major Western powers do not have positive population growth, they have negative population growth. And Israel, uh, had, I think it was a 1.7%, I'm not sure population growth, and they are on their track in a few years to, to hit 10 million there. I think that now it's like 9.3 million residents. 
about you know, 7,000 Jews, 2,000 Arabs, and the balance of other nationalities. Aliyah is strong, but not the major source of the growth. I think Aliyah become, is 16%, uh, I believe, is what the Aliyah part was in that growth. So we see, we see God's promise to Rachel coming to light uh, today. That's a parenthetical you know, comment, a very important one. So who, 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 who is Yaakov angry with about this charade? You can, you can unmute yourself to respond. It's not really a trick question, although uh, it's not 100% straightforward. But you know, I'm I'm not keeping records. Love on. Okay, that's true. Is there anybody else? In the Torah, there is nobody else. It's very interesting that in the Torah, Yaakov does not express any anger to. Uh, uh, to Leah, nor to Rachel. Now, by Rachel, I, I don't think we'd be surprised, even though she did give up the, the password, and that changed Yaakov's future. In some ways, it helped to change the, even the whole future of the children of Israel. But, uh, but you, 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 know, you, you can understand why Yaakov would have sympathy, uh, empathy, for the decision that Rachel made. We could, we wouldn't be surprised if, if Yaakov criticized Leah, but the Torah doesn't record that. The Medrash does record a criticism. According in the, the Medrash Tanchuma says as follows, that the entire night, the bride was acting as if she was Rachel. And, and in the morning, when the light was shining, Yaakov sees, behold, she's none other than, than Leah. So he said to her, Yaakov said to, uh, to Leah, Bat Haramai, you are a daughter of a deceiver. Now, what does that mean? It means the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. You know, it implies like, just like your father is a deceiver, now I see you're also a deceiver. Lama remit oti. Why did you deceive me? Says the, the Medrash. Now, Leah is rather sharp in, uh, in her response. We'll talk uh, what could have been an alternate one momentarily, Blineda. Leah's response is the Ata Lama remita avicha. How about you, my dear new husband? Why did you deceive your father? So she gives it back. I guess she's implying that there are certain circumstances. I'm not justifying Leia now, by the way, but Leia might be saving, saying there are certain circumstances that might uh, justify deception. Or she just might be trying to defend herself. But it seems that with the absence of any type of reproach to uh, Leo or to Rachel that Yaakov understood it was a difficult situation. Lavan was not an easy character to deal with. So Yaakov understands that his daughters were under pressure. It, it would appear that we could say that Yaakov understood the principle of to be Dan the Kafshut, to judge somebody favorably. Now, usually, when we use that expression, we're, we're talking about be careful before you criticize something, because maybe what you heard is not true. And if you heard it directly, maybe you didn't understand it in, in the way it was meant. Maybe you're seeing something that, that, that looks to be uncomplimentary, but maybe you're not seeing the right thing. That's... Uh, uh, that's how we usually understand it. I think I, I, you may have heard me share the story of my uh, friend who after shul one morning, he's not here in Boca, up north someplace, 
after shul one morning, in that shul, they would sit at tables and, and somebody had to leave a drop early for the minion and he slapped down a, a, a cassette. I know that most of us here know what cassette tapes are. And he slap, slaps down the cassette, you know, it was a, with a little force. So it's like sort of, you know, my friend took a note of this. And, uh, and after davening, he looks at the cassette and the cassette says the perils of speaking lush and horror. And my friend gets very upset. What did, I, what did I do? Why is he giving me this tape? I must have offended him. And he couldn't reach the fellow until the evening. And, and he said to him, you know, why did I do something wrong? What are you talking about? He says, well, you gave me this tape about, you know, the perils of speaking Lush and Harab. So I'm wondering, did, did I say something, uh, you know, about you or to you that, uh, that, that offended you? He says, what are you talking about? Don't you remember you asked me to give you a, 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 a song? So I took an old tape that I had in the house and I taped over and I put the song on it. So here, you know, my friend thought he knew the whole situation, but he, he made up his own story. It wasn't true. So that's the classic example of judging favorably, because even though we're convinced at times that we know exactly what we saw, what we heard, what was done, very often we really don't know the whole story or any of the whole story, maybe you know, totally inaccurate, as was in this case. But there's another dimension to being down the cops hood for judging favorably, and that is you're hundred percent right in what happened. You know, you 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 can you are right in having all of the details, but then you you pause to try to understand why that person might have done what he did. So that that appears to be what Yaakov did, that he understood it was difficult for his, uh, you know, for his uh, wives now, or it will, well, shortly to be two wives, for the two daughters of Lavan, Rachel, and Leah, that they were not in easy circumstances. In the Medrash, there is, there is this rebuke that Yaakov does give Leah. You know, he doesn't harp on it too much. He goes and he speaks to Lavan. That's the part that the Chumash focuses on. But I, I'm not aware of person, I'm not saying it, it, it doesn't exist, but I don't think it would exist. Uh, but we don't, we don't see rebuke to Rachel for, for what she did. Now, I, I want to specifically elaborate on a couple of points last week, because the, the way we got to this discussion was that I pointed out in the name of Rav Salavechik, that Yehuda was in a face-off with Yosef of leadership of the Jewish people. You know, at this point, Yosef seems to be the leader. He's the viceroy in Egypt. He's the one who can ensure the family's viability, the ability to survive during the fact, he did in fact you know, make sure that food got to the family. He saved the entire region with his plan for uh, store, gathering, storing, distributing, and selling uh, uh, grain, a and he has tremendous power, even though the famine uh, ended once ya Yaakov arrived, there was a special blessing from, from Hashem. So, he, so Yosef you know, sees himself as the potential leader of the Jewish people, and, and he feels that he has good, a good resume he has the practical, real-life, administrative leadership of, of, a, of a country. And he's also a very spiritual person. Those are the two dreams of Yosef. But Yehuda emerges as the one from whom all legitimate kings of Israel, including the Mashiach, who will be a king of Israel, will emanate from. And, and I, I noted that, that Yehuda, Rev. Soloveitchik noted that Yehuda had courage and we see that his mother had courage too. So in, in, in making that point, that doesn't mean that because Leah had courage to go ahead with her father's uh, scheme, um, it doesn't mean that she acted properly in that case. What it meant, and, and she too had a bind, you know, one way or another, she had to be courageous. She would have to be courageous to refuse her father's directives, especially in society at that time. 
and she had to be courageous to go ahead with her father's directive. So, you know, she was potentially in a no-win situation and it, and it, you know, to a degree ended up as a no-win, but, the, but there was a prize. She still remained to, to be a wife of, of, of Yaakov. But she, but she did have, she did demonstrate courage. She, the courage was not necessarily used the right way, but she had courage. Yehuda uses courage the right way. Yehuda admits publicly to, a, uh, to an act that was embarrassing, but saved the life of, a, of another woman, of his daughter-in-law, Tamar. So he acted courageously then when nobody except he and Tamar knew the truth and Tana, Tamar in deference to you, uh, Yehuda was not going to speak up. So Yehuda could have gotten away with it, but at the cost of Tamar's life. And he courageously ad admitted his responsibility in fathering the uh, baby, or as it turned out, babies that uh, Tamar was carrying. And then, he's, then, he, then he speaks up to the viceroy, trying to save Binyamin at, his per, at Yehuda's personal expense. Of, he's not asking for a total uh, pardon of the entire event. He's only asking to be accepted as a substitute for Binyamin. So Leia, yes, Leia was courageous and she passed on the ability to be courageous to Yehuda. Leia may not have used her courage the right way. Yehuda uses his courage the right way. And that's like a first major uh, supplement that I want to make to our discussion from last week. The other that I want to say, I mentioned last week that embarrassing a person when, when the embarrassment is, is known to others, it, uh, it, especially it's considered to be like, you know, a, somewhat akin to murder. And just like a person's face can turn red in embarrassment and red is the color of blood, it's like spilling somebody's blood. And so Rachel chose the lesser of the two wrongdoings by passing along the, the code in order to save Leia from that embarrassment. But, you know, I, I, I want to make it clear it because that case did in, involve something akin to life and death, to be sure we should take note that the Gemara uh, cites the case of Rava who, who was asked the question that the Roman uh, governor when, uh, instructed a Jew to kill John Doe or, or he, this Jew, would be killed himself. So, you know, one way or the other, the Roman governor in an act of cruelty wanted somebody dead and it didn't matter to him who it would be or, or maybe he wanted to have that torment, that satisfaction of tormenting the Jew who he addressed. So it was kill or be killed. One is not allowed to follow through. The case that Rabbi was, is, was asking about, was a, a, it was a totally innocent person who was identified as being the intended victim by the Roman governor. Perhaps he didn't want his hands or any of his own soldiers to be directly involved with the murder of this person. Perhaps it was just, a, you know, in his mind, like a, a lock and a whim, but it, it is, Rava's re response is, who says that your blood is redder than the other person's blood? So we don't have the right to take a, an innocent life to save our life. That those are, um, those are not uh, competing values. Taking a, an innocent life is, is not allowed. However, if the person could have killed the, the Roman governor uh, or anybody after him, he's allowed to do that because that's self-defense. That's not the murder. That's not taking an innocent life. So uh, very, very important point uh, to, uh, as, as, as important as our you know, lives are, it doesn't allow us to take an innocent life. There's another famous story in the Gemara of two, uh, two friends traveling in the desert. 
and either they one of them misjudged his water supply or something happened to it but one was out of water and the other one had a canteen full of water and they each knew that to survive the desert heat they would need to drink the full can any one person would need a full canteen of water in order to survive until they got to the next available water source. And, and there's a discussion in the, in the Gemara, there's a machlokas, a difference of opinion. And as I says, they should split the water, even though it means they'll both die, because neither one of them will get adequate. And Rabbi Akiva says, no, the person with the canteen should drink the water. And you know, in that case, that one person, that was his supply of water. So he was entitled to drink his water in order to survive, even though it meant the other person most likely would not survive. If he had plenty of other water and he just didn't want to give any of his water away and there was no justification for it, that would be a different story. But if both, each of them are in that situation that they have to drink a canteen of water to survive the desert and one person owns that canteen of water, he's allowed to drink his own canteen of water. So, you know, our lives are very important, but it's, uh, it, but we're not allowed to take somebody else's life in order to save our own life. So those are, you know, some uh, complementary, complementary with an E, you know, supplements that, 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 that help fill in what we uh, spoke about last week. And, and now let's turn to, uh, to this week's episode. If you have a chumash, you could look at chapter 50, Pasuk 14. In Hebrew, that's Nun and Pasuk Yudalit, chapter 50, verse 14. Oh, actually, before I start that, if anybody has a question or a comment, you're welcome to unmute yourselves and share it. You don't have to be humble. Asking a question is a great way to learn, not just for the person who asked the question, but for the other people who hear it, and even for the person who responds to the question. Even if he has a good answer, he may not have had that good answer if he didn't have the question. So I'm, I'm, all, I'm all for it with a question. I appreciate your thoughts. What's that? That's Larry. I appreciate your thoughts. And, uh, I can't, I'm, I'm not able to hear you clearly. Could you check your uh, signal or, or microphone or get closer to the microphone? No. Okay. All right. So I can't. I don't know how to fix the problem. Uh, I I I heard that. If you could, if you could be um, in the same position as you said, I don't know how to fix the problem. I'm, I I might be able to hear your question. So. You know, as I'm beginning on my journey to learn Torah and the Talmud and the thing of good Jew, I like to tell the story. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not able to hear it, but maybe you can get in touch with me after the class and tell me the question. And uh, uh, not only might I share an answer with you, but maybe next week I could share it with others as well. So you're welcome to, you know, to do that. I encourage you to do that. Um, Okay. So in chapter 50 is it's after Yaakov passes away. I'm just opening up my own Chumash. To that point. In the chapter 49, the blessings have been uh, given by Yaakov Jacob to his 
there's children. And, and at the end of that chapter, the very end of that chapter is the, the death of Yaakov. The burial is held in the land of Canaan, the land of Israel. And all, all the brothers accompanying Yosef, there's a, a, you know, a very uh, regal delegation with chariots from Egypt uh, going into Canaan for the funeral. And when the funeral is over and the delegation returns back to Egypt, that's where we pick up in verse 14 it says that, that uh, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and all of his brothers and all of the others that went up to Canaan to bury their father. And then it says, The brothers of Yosef saw that their father had died. I mean, really? Right. You just made a big trip into Canaan, this royal delegation for a major, major funeral. And, and it didn't happen the day after Yaakov died. There was a mourning process in, in Egypt first. And now you first understand that your father died. But there was an aspect to Yaakov's death that they were focusing on. Vayomru, they said, Lu Yisrimenu Yosef, Ashev Yashivlanu. They were afraid that now Yosef would have license to take revenge against them. They understood, they weren't necessarily surprised why Yosef was so kind to them while Yaakov was alive. They, they understood that, Yaakov had great res that Yosef had great respect for Yaakov and wouldn't want to do anything to upset their father. But now they're nervous. Yaakov is not on the scene. So is it now that Yosef's going to take revenge on us for, you know, really horrendous situation that we caused him? So, and then the, and then the, the Torah continues. Vayitzavu el Yosef lemor. They sent a messenger to Yosef saying, Avicha tziva lifnei moto lemor. Your father commanded before he died, saying, Kotomru li Yosef, that, that Yaakov spoke to the other brothers and said, This is what you shall tell Joseph. Ana, sana, pesha, chet, vechatatam, ki, ra'ag, malucha. You know, please, you know, forgive the transgression of your. Uh, of your of, of your brothers, the like the, the intentional horrendous act and the sin that that and that they caused you uh, uh, pain, bad ra'a, bad things. But and then, and the ata sana lefesh aday elokei avicha. So now they add to it, you know, to to please forgive us. In the, in the. The, the servants of uh, those who adhere to the same God, you know, we're all part of the same family, to, you know, to, to forgive us. And, and Yosef's reaction is what? He cries. He cries, and all of them start crying. And they offer, in that crying, to be slaves to Yosef. But why was Yosef crying? Why was he crying? According to uh, Rashi, citing multiple sources, he, he was crying because his, bro his brother suspected him. He, he knew his father didn't suspect him of, of being evil, that he would do evil, that he would take revenge, harm his brothers. But he was crying that his brothers felt that as a very real possibility 
and that they had that pain. Ra Rashi, actually, actually, this is the Rashi I was starting to refer to. Rashi says that they made it up. That it's, uh, you know, it, it's not, it's, it's not possible that that Yaakov would actually have said that in, in uh, Nahama Leibowitz's uh, uh, book of essays on Sefer Breshit, the, the book of Genesis. So, you know, she lists uh, you know, multiple questions found in the sources. Is, she, you know, she, she describes it's like it would be a, a strange request. Here, if, if, if Yaakov really wanted to ensure that Yosef would not take revenge on his brothers, why didn't Yaakov ask Yosef directly? He met with Yosef at the beginning of this, of this week's Pasha, and he asks him to please take an oath to, to make sure he is buried not in Egypt, but rather in Canaan, in the land of Israel. So why not ask Yosef at the same time? Don't harm your brothers. Why put that request to the brothers themselves? So that's two questions. One, it would have been a perfect time for Yaakov to make that request personally. And, and the request is somewhat diluted if you have to have the potential victims make the request themselves, doesn't seem, you know, so likely. And a big question is, did Yaakov even ever know that the brothers were responsible for Yosef's disappearance? It would seem more likely that Yaakov just thought that on the way to Shechem, which Yaakov knew was a dangerous place, that Yaakov assumed either as the brothers, you know, wanted, well, you know, originally he assumed he was uh, torn to pieces by an animal. That's the, the evidence that the brothers you know, tried to create and present to, to Yaakov. But now that, that Yaakov you know, knew that obviously that wasn't the case because Yosef was the viceroy in Egypt and he gets to see him face to face and he's alive and well, so he, he, he must have just changed his understanding that it was a dangerous trip and, and people abducted him and decided, thank God they didn't kill him. They sold him into slavery and eventually, you know, ended up as, as, as a viceroy. So the, the whole premise, you know, that, you know, that, that, that's why you, to, that, that the brothers would be, that Yosef would be crying about the brother's pain because Yosef knows that he never told his father and support for that, and we don't have it in black and white, but support for that would, would be, is that so, someone had to come to tell Yosef that Yaakov was ill. He didn't even know Yaakov, uh, uh, Yosef tried to like not have private meetings with his father. He didn't want to put it because he know the fa his father would never ask him when other people were present. He wouldn't want to embarrass the brothers. So that, that Yosef did, uh, avoided, uh, avoid these private meetings. In fact, you know, one of, one of the reasons that the brothers thought that, Yaakov, that Yosef was getting ready to take revenge is is that they, he didn't invite them? Uh, he wasn't inviting them to uh, you know his palace, you know, to have uh, or even to go to them, you know, for a, a meal. Where in reality, talking about Dan the Kafskut, judging favorably, Yosef avoided that because as long as Yaakov was alive, so it was easy, you know, to, that Yaakov would sit at the head of the table. He was the patriarch. But now that Yosef's going, he's the viceroy of Egypt. So he has to be at the head of the table, but he didn't want to do that to the brothers. So he avoided certain things. And, uh, you know, so it was just like just the opposite of what was in Yosef's heart and mind and his actions where he's trying to be sensitive to his brothers and then to see that his brothers are so scared to death, so to say, 
of what Yosef is going to do. So, uh, so Yosef, you know, you know, cries. But, but there is discussion then on the premise that the, that the brothers made this request of, of Yaakov up, that it was not true. So that, so there is discussion and exploration and even justification of whether or not it was okay for the brothers to change the truth, in this case, make up something in, uh, in order to try to, uh, to save themselves. So there are some who actually, you know, you know, view this question as one of life and death, because even though they offered to be slaves, not that that would be the greatest type of life, but even though they offered to be slaves, they understood that if Yosef were to order their execution, that it, you know they could understand why he why he would do it. And it, in such a case, they were creating something to save their lives. Again, it's a competing value. Uh, speak the truth or possibly be executed. And the, speaking the truth is not going to harm physically anybody else. You know, it's not as if they said, no, we didn't do it, you know, or somebody else did it. Uh, so, uh, you know, and even there, uh, that, that's an interesting question. I won't, I won't deal with it, you know, right, right, right now. But, but so, so, so some hold the view that this was a life and death situation. There's no question about it. That in life and death situations, that you can you have a lot a lot of room to uh, not to speak the full truth. But but it, this is actually looked as a as a source for helping to create shalom. Now, in a different way, uh, you know, Hashem does this much er earlier in the Torah. Now, where when when Sarah hears that uh, she's going to bear a child at a ripe old age, and you know she's like amazed about it, you know that that she could do that, and especially since her husband, who would also have to play a role in fathering the child, that he that he's an old man. When Hashem tells this over to uh, Abraham, he doesn't tell Abraham that Sarah called him an old man. So that's an early source of changing something to keep peace between husband and, and, and wife. And, uh, but here it what goes a little bit more because they created something, it wasn't like an omission of something. An omission is, is better than you know, fabricating something. You don't have to tell somebody, you know, while, while I was uh, uh, standing online in the supermarket from six feet away, I, I, I heard uh, so-and-so talking about you to the person behind her. You don't have to let that person know that they were being talked about, you know, unless there's some harm that they're planning, in which case you'd have to let them know the harm. But, uh, but otherwise you don't have to let them know and cause them uh, more grief. So, but, so there, but this is a, 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 another major, major source uh, in our discussion of competing values of uh, of where we can learn that even though the brothers were uh, wrong in their assessment that Yosef uh, had it in for them, but nevertheless it set a certain model that to uh, that to create a peace that you can to some degree change. Now we have to use that very very carefully because uh, MS, speaking the truth, is a tremendous value in the Torah and in Jewish life. So we should not take any uh, limitation, uh, any exclusions. Uh, we, we can't take them lightly. We have to really assess the situation very carefully and always know that uh, that truth is a very, very high value. But sometimes there are things a little, a little bit greater. So may we all be successful in something. promoting shalom. And yes, finally, I have a question for the day. No, I was just going to say that um, 
we see how important family is to Yosef because he did forgive his brothers and he, you know, and he wanted peace in the family. And then right after that, it talks about that he lived 110 years. And then it says he saw three generations in his family. And it, then it's, it's very specific who the generations were. And so, um, and then at the very end, it says he died. Like in the beginning, it says he lived 110 years. And then at the conclusion of the parak, it says he died at the age of 110 years. And they embalmed him and he was placed in a coffin in Egypt. So like the first part of the living, even though he had a very important role in Egypt, his maybe his most important part of his living experience was his relationship with his family and the people that were going to come from him. And then when he died, his physicality was embalmed. And so that he, like, just like the big, um, you know, tombs in Egypt, which, you know, debated, like, which exactly which time period that's from. But, you know, they obviously that culture had a very big emphasis on the physical. And so here, you know, you have these two, the balance of the two, the physicality and the, the spirituality and the emotional and his, you know, his physical generations that are leaving him, but not the physical body of Yosef. And that was more like the physical preservation of being in Egypt and having that position. But like you said, the importance of forgiveness and his family, that's when it uses the word live in Egypt. And, you know, and the death was the physical death of him. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes, I do have a question, Rabbi Yasker. Um, the the uh, famine ended at the latest five years after Yaakov came to Egypt and perhaps two years after Yaakov came to Egypt. No, two, two years after it started, when Yaakov came to Egypt is right. the uh, other view. Okay, but what I'm saying is why didn't they just go back to Israel after the famine was over? Right. Because God told him he had to stay there. That's a great question. But if you take a look in last week's Pasha, um, there are two references to Yaakov going down to Egypt after God's command to him. So um, I'm just going to flip quickly to find the uh, the, the psukim. The one second. So when, when God, no, for when, ya when Yaakov first leaves, if you want to, I don't know if you could check it now, if you want to check it later, but in, uh, in Perak, Memhe 45, the, it's the, the last, the, the last Pasuk in chapter 45, that's verse 28, says by Yome Yisrael, Israel said, that, that's the, the, the higher level of Jacob's name, the changed name. Rav O Yosef Mini Chai, it's a great thing that my son Yosef is still alive. El Chader Er Enu B'Terem Amut. I will go and see him before I die. Uh, what's the implication there? Third, it, it's that he would wanted to see him and then go back. And but it takes a lot of courage, even. I mean, you know, the Israel is it's a high, high name, and, 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 it, re, and it refers to a lot of things like the, the you know, a, a high state, a, a fulfilled state, a state of strength, high spirituality. And, and, and here it carries a connotation. That Yaakov was doing something courageous in leaving the land he never wanted to leave again once he came back. So this is, you know, if you were, if you were part of our discussion on Yeshiv Yaakov, Eretz Megurei Aviv, Eretz Canaan, that 
that Yosef dwelt in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan, Yaakov wanted to stay in Israel and never have to come back. So the fact that he was going to leave took a lot of courage and, and, a, and a, a, a high level of, of, of his inner strength. And, and he does that. And, and it says that he traveled and he came to Be'er Sheva. And he, he offered a sacrifice in Be'er Sheva before continuing his trip, but he stays overnight. And he has a vision overnight where God says to him, Al don't fear going down to Egypt, because it's there in Egypt that I'm going to make you in to a great nation. So, and when, 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 when our patriarch wakes up, it says, He gets up and his children carry him, transport him to Egypt. It's Yaakov who wakes up. He goes to, he went to sleep as Yisrael. He wakes up as Yaakov. It was Yaakov is a name of diaspora existence, not at the, at the fulfillment. Yaakov wanted to stay in Israel. He wanted his family to be united in, in Israel. But he, uh, he was told otherwise, that there was some other divine plan that we had to be in the land of Egypt. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Okay, I'm going to wish you all a good day. Remember also tonight is a special program coordinated by BRS, a Zoom program on the, uh, the world of Hasidus. Uh, you're welcome to join us at 8.30 p.m. Saturday night and Sunday morning. Uh, we have not only our Havdalah program, Motzei Shabbos, Saturday night, but we also have at 8.30 uh, the first of two presentations by our uh, get, get, uh, scholar in, in, in residence, <laughs> but it's in residence via Zoom. Our special annual scholar program is taking place on Zoom. It's actually a son of one of our members, uh, Rabbi Sittner, the son of our, our member Sharon Sittner, will be speaking at 8.30 Motzei Shabbos and 10.30 Sunday morning.